All right, so and let's start with very simply, what is anxiety? And then okay. and then thereafter, what is an anxiety disorder and when and when does the one lead to the other? Lovely. So the great news about it is that anxiety, despite the fact that it often gets spoken about as a pathology or a disease, is neither. Anxiety is actually an emotion. So you can think of anxiety as a state of physical tension, apprehension, and worry about the future when you're presented with a situation that feels uncertain or uncontrollable. That's really what anxiety is about. So it's this, it's this pattern of activation that occurs in any of us whenever we're confronted with a future that feels uncertain or uncontrollable. It's, it's kind of important because very often, and especially when we've been tremendously anxious, our greatest fantasy is, is to not be anxious, right? To never feel it again. Mm. Um, but Steven Pinker has wonderful thoughts in this regard. So Steven Pinker in his book, Enlightenment Now, um, my favorite chapter of that book is chapter two, where he actually talks a lot about the origins of anxiety. And he says, anxiety starts further back than you'd ever imagine. In fact, anxiety is a state that first came into being about 13.8 billion years ago. So as far as we can tell, the universe started around that time, and that's actually where you found the origin of anxiety. And the way he explains it, I know, the way he explains it is he says, it's around that time that the laws of physics as we know them for now came into being. They started to operate. And he says that one of the best things you can learn as a psychologist and as a human being is that the first law, oh, sorry, the second law of thermodynamics is actually the first law of psychology. So the second law of thermodynamics says that the total amount of entropy in a closed system never decreases. So that means chaos constantly increases and abounds in open systems. Now we notice this as human beings. We've got a whole bunch of sayings for this. So we know that everything's rusts. Any idiot can break a barn, it takes a genius to build one. We even say things like anything that can go wrong will go wrong in Murphy's law or my favorite shit happens. We know this to be intrinsically true. Things are always going to go wrong. Chaos will always abound. This is the universe in which we live. So if you live in that situation, because you know everything is constantly going wrong and will go wrong, you are forced, therefore, to always be anxious. Mm. So why that's worth noting is anxiety is an emotion. It's a system wired into our bodies that's designed to help us anticipate and manage an otherwise uncertain and uncontrollable world and future. Now, where we get confused sometimes is that we sometimes a feature, make it not a bug. It's actually a feature, not a bug. It's exactly what it is. And that's why we say it's not a pathology, it's an emotion. It's not a feature, it's not a bug. And as I often say to people who are struggling with anxiety, your nervous system isn't misfiring right now. It's doing exactly what it should. So very much what you're saying. And that becomes really important because we often get mistaken between anxiety and fear. Fear is when you have apprehension and tension about something that's happening to you right now. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a present clear danger in front of you. Anxiety isn't about the present. Anxiety is about the future. Anxiety is about what's to come. And as much as that can be difficult for us sometimes, there's also levels at which that can be advantageous, frankly. So one of the things to know about anxiety is that our ability to consider and anticipate bad things happening can be really helpful in creating solutions now for problems that can exist tomorrow. That kind of worked out for us pretty well because we deal with things before they occur. This is why Liddell calls anxiety the shadow of intelligence, and that's why Alfred North Whitehead's description of anxiety is amongst my favorites, where he says, the reason we have anxiety is so that our thoughts will die instead of us. Because you have anxiety, well, that's why you study for exams. That's why you take out insurance. That's why you have medical aid. That's why you have security. That's even why you have manners. Because if you couldn't worry about the possibility of offending someone else, well, you, you, you'd never be able to manage your social behavior. So in regulated amounts, Anxiety actually serves a lot of profound functions that really help us, even though it makes us uncomfortable. So when does it become a disorder? So the line drawn is not about the presence of anxiety, but rather about the absence of coping. So to, to your point, anxiety is a feature, not a bug. So if I said to you, 
James, you know what? I'm really, really anxious. And you say to me, okay, well, and what, what are you worried about? Maybe what, what's the particular thing you're nervous about? And I say, James, you know what? I might be anxious that um, I want to ask this girl on a date and I'm worried I might be rejected. And you say, okay, cool. Well, fair enough. The fact that I'm anxious is priming me to the possibility of going wrong. Now, the fact that I'm anxious isn't disordered. But if I told you, James, I'm so anxious that I actually don't know how to manage this feeling or address this situation, I'm now in a state of disorder. Mm. And that's part of the reason that they use that particular word. Because we don't say anxiety disease. We say anxiety disorder. You don't know how to bring order to the emotion. You don't know what to do yeah. with the feeling, how to appropriately cope with it. So like, <clears throat> how, how does that tie into a disorder that I'm like just constantly worried about what's going to happen, even when the probability is so infinitesimally small that it shouldn't that it shouldn't be triggering anxiety it's malfunctioning absolutely well that still falls within line of coping because coping is also knowing how to manage your mind and your thoughts so there are a lot of ways in which you can cope with anxiety there's so many different angles and some work better than others for different people but i'll just use one example so let's say you're in a in, in, in that moment you're saying to me and i'm worried about these 99 things i recognize that they're highly unlikely. In fact, they're improbable. They're possible, but they're extremely unlikely. And then let's say we add one more layer and we say to you, well, and I've done everything that I meaningfully could to protect against those bad outcomes, but I still worry about the possibility that it could happen. So you've actually done a lot of good things in that space. Where the disorder comes in is that what you perhaps haven't trained yourself and your mind to do yet is to learn to reground itself in the present rather than become overly preoccupied with the future. So mm -hmm. even though you've learned to cope from a behavioral perspective, yes, from your yeah. psychological perspective, there is still a skill to master. And that skill psychologists would call mindfulness. Out of all of the emotions that we have, like, so like the I, like for example, anger disorders, for example, right? And you may have answered it in, in saying that like anxiety is actually a feature of the universe, which might make it distinct from other emotions. But why, why is it that it's a more prolific kind of disorder than other emotions? Like I'm pathologically jealous or I'm pathologically, do you know what I'm saying? <clears throat> why does it think like anxiety affects people the most? So I, I think it actually goes back to, and forgive me, because I know I do this often. It actually goes back to one of the great theorists, which was Freud. So in 1914, in his introductory lectures to psychoanalysis, he said something really, really perspicacious. He suggested that anxiety is an emotional nodal point, and it is a riddle of which the solution, if revealed, will flood light across the entirety of a person's mental life. So in plain terms, what that means is anxiety is more prolific because anxiety is actually a representative node that links up to all of your other emotions. Mm, and this it's like foundational, fun. but it's, and that, and that kind of links to what you were saying about it being part of the universe. It's like a foundational yeah. emotion. Exactly right. So it regulates the other emotions. And by virtue of that fact, it's more prolific. So as, as some people will say, you know, it's, it's, it's quite telling because some people will say to me, they're like, I'm not an anxious person or I'm an anxious person. And I'll say to you, look, it's not so much whether you're anxious or not. You can tell a lot about a person, not by asking whether they're anxious or not. What I'd be curious about in a person is how anxious are you and what are you anxious about? Because when you know those things, that starts linking into all those other emotions that you're talking about. So why do you think it's been pathologized? Do you think it's, is this just big pharma? Like basically saying, oh, well, here's something that makes people feel really shit. And so we're going to call it a disease and then be able to sell their medications for the rest of their lives. <laughs> Look, I think, I think there could probably be some of that at play, but I do think it actually relates to a more fundamental difficulty of humanity, which is quite interesting. What we've noticed about the way that our world has developed and how we've shaped things for ourselves is that we've increasingly, by virtue of being anxious, tried to limit the potential risks we experience. So as many people will tell you, the world is an objectively much safer place than it used to be, yet ironically, we're more anxious than we yeah. used to be. 
And that's because our minds have steered away from things like fear of physical danger, and they've become much more emotional, cognitive, abstract, and competitive, and therefore it creates more anxiety. But the bigger change that we see for human beings is that we've started to build our world more and more and more and more and more around the concept of comfort. And what's difficult for us is that we, we do gravitate towards comfort. And the reason we gravitate towards comfort is that our mind links up with what's pleasurable and tries to run away from what's painful. But running away from pain isn't always the best resolution because where our brains get confused and where our minds struggle is that very often we struggle to distinguish between pain and discomfort. And that's a crucial distinction. And there's a lot of ways you can shape the terminology, but essentially the reference I'm making is that there are instances where you're going to have uncomfortable or, or negative, even painful sensations. And they're painful in the sense that having them leads to no good in your life, right? So if I put my hand on a stove that's, that's switched on, I'm not doing anything good for myself. That bad feeling means that's a bad thing. Don't do it anymore. But there are versions of discomfort where even though it feels uncomfortable and not so great, by enduring it, you get something even better than you otherwise would have had. So there would be the obvious resolution of if I go to the gym and I put my body into pain in a literal sense, on the other side of it, not mm -hmm. only is my body, but so is my mind going to react in an incredibly positive way. What we've sometimes done is we've started to build societies, cultures, and everyday lives around creating so much comfort for ourselves that we sometimes try to avoid any discomfort if we can help it. And that's spilled into the way that we think about emotions. So a lot of us have put, adopted this relationship to our emotions of every time an emotion is uncomfortable or unpleasant, that means it's bad. And if it's bad, well, then it's like pain. And if it's pain, then it's wrong. When you mix that in to a medical model that says all forms of emotional suffering are misfiring of brain circuits, when you put those two things together, we create the perception that all unpleasant, painful emotions are diseases. And we then spend 40 years teaching everybody that message. And even if we're well-intended, so maybe it is kind of being, you know, um, cupidious and, 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 and we're trying to be opportunistic, but it can also be that you meant well. The problem is that you've taught people the wrong message because you've given them the impression that unpleasantness and discomfort is your enemy when sometimes it's actually not only okay, it's actually adaptive, it's actually necessary, and it's even useful to you in your life. Mm. So the kindest interpretation of this, other than conspiracy theories about big pharma, is the road to hell is paved with good intentions, that we've, we've, gotten, we've gotten so good at making life easy, it's kind of like we've just swung from the sublime to the ridiculous, that here's something else that'll make your life easier. Here's something else that'll make your life easier. And then all of a sudden it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. we're now eliminating the acute stresses that we need to actually keep in balance. It's that exactly that. It's exactly that. And by doing so, we pathologize the discomfort. And because it's bad, we constantly try to eliminate it through avoidance, through addiction, through medication. And we get stuck in a horrible cycle because one of the great ironies, and, and a lot of us only appreciate it when it happens, is that if you were to eliminate that anxiety, or if you were to eliminate all adversity, all challenge, all potential threat, what happens to human beings is you don't enter into states of Zen calm. Ironically, you enter into states of depression because you feel totally stagnant and meaningless and your yeah. self-esteem runs. So the irony is even when we take away this unpleasant feeling, it just gets replaced by a different unpleasant feeling. And that's why a lot of what we're doing is we're finding that people gain much more value by learning to work with an emotion, learn to cope with it, learn what it's signaling to you, help decode it, and then act in accordance with it because that's where your fulfillment will be rather than trying to eliminate it. Okay, so why is it so difficult? So, so if the system's malfunctioning, and or I now have an anxiety disorder, why is it so difficult to get out of? It's mostly difficult to get out of because we often approach the, we approach the problem from the wrong direction. When we're struggling with an anxiety disorder, because we're suffering so much, what we try to do is we try to get our, our nervous system to stop firing. 
We try to get rid of the anxiety mm -hmm. rather than the coping. Rather than eliminate it, we've got to teach you to stop, stop hating the feeling and start learning to listen to it and then realize what we're going to build is we're going to build a whole bunch of strategies that teach you how to tolerate and manage it so that even though the feeling won't go away, you'll get so much better at managing it that it won't feel like suffering anymore. Okay, so this is so cool because the next question I had was why is psilocybin so good at helping with anxiety disorders? But before you answer that, I want to share my own subjective experience of how psilocybin helped me deal with mm -hmm. my anxiety disorder. So mm -hmm. don't need to go into the details of where it comes from or whatever, but basically always suffered from tremendous anxiety, whether it was going into an exam at university or a big business deal that I was doing. It, would, it, it wouldn't matter the, the kind of consequence of the big deal or whatever. It, it was like my heart rate would just go up to like 150. So on a psilocybin retreat I did last year, November, um, going into the journey, I was very, very nervous. My heart rate was at like 150 in anticipation of the journey that I was, that I was going to do. And 70% of the journey, I would say, was literally about the, the medicine teaching me how to deal with anxiety. And the, what, what it felt like subjectively was exactly what you're saying we want to teach people to do that it helped accelerate for me subjectively, which is this. It, the, the, the experience would show me something terrifying and scary. I would even have scary symptoms in my body of like heat and pain. And I'd been learning some coping mechanisms of just breathing and, and meditation prior to, prior to this. And as I was, and I'd also been suffering from panic attacks, actually, like for about a year, a year before, which was new to me, I hadn't, uh, that, that, that had only come up in the, in the previous 12 months. And so through the panic attacks or whatever, I developed these skills of just being able to breathe. And, and, and for, for the, what I would do is I would just say to myself, you know, just breathe this too shall pass, this just breathe this too shall pass. And as I was able to um, prevent myself from, let's say, going over the edge of panic and like then entering into like a positive feedback loop of a panic attack, and I was able to kind of just center myself a little bit, even though it was fucking horribly discomforting, the experience would shift into something beautiful and stunning. And 70% of the experience, I swear, for four hours was an oscillation between these two extremes. And I literally, it, afterwards, when I, when I look back at it, it literally felt like the drug was training my central nervous system. That's what, that's what it felt like subjectively. It was incredibly powerful and it was curative. I mean, it, it really did. I don't suffer from panic attacks at all. I did. I don't want to uh, sell people on, the, uh, on any of the stuff being a silver bullet because I think I still did have like one or two after that. But this is what's interesting about the integration is that it takes some time sometimes for it to kind of get like fully integrated. And I now don't suffer from them at all. And my anxiety is tremendously better. So that's, I think, cool to describe what it feels like subjectively. Why maybe neuroscientifically is psilocybin good at helping with these so-called disorders? When you're in a psychedelic state, psilocybin in particular teaches you to re-examine the same sensation from a different perspective and it offers you lessons in that regard so rather than you necessarily thinking okay i can only see anxiety or this reaction in my body as an evil bad thing a psychedelic will give you an experience of saying well also look at it in another way so one of the things that's horrible about a panic attack is that a panic attack is characterized by a sense of helplessness. And the helplessness comes from the fact of you don't always know what it means. You don't know when it's going to come and you're not sure exactly if, you, if you're going to be okay in it. Because it's like, it's a horrifying feeling. It's really overwhelming for anyone. I can attest and to if that. You're, in you're completely lost in it. <laughs> well, you're com when you're in the depths of it, you really, you, you, the, the other, the other um, big ca a character of this experience was this, dis this, uh, this sort of dis identification. So these two experiences that I, that I had of, you know, horrible like thing uh, freaking me out and then shifting to something beautiful in both of those, I was actually removed from the emotion. It was like, I was, I was watching it as opposed to be lost in it. Yeah. Yeah. But that, that's exactly it is when you're in it, you feel stuck, you feel helpless, you feel overwhelmed. 
And what therapy often tries to teach you to do, but psilocybin really catalyzes in a very profound way, is to learn to change your stance towards your emotion. And that's exactly what you were doing in, in that experience where you were stepping out of it for a second and saying, well, am I stuck? Is it extraordinarily evil? Is it infinite? Is it all of these things? And it suggests that you know it's not. It's not permanent. It's not automatically bad. There could be meaning to it. You can survive this. You will be all right. And when you learn those processes, whether you're learning it in a traditional therapy or you're learning it in psychedelic ways, you change your relationship to the emotion. And when you no longer pathologize it, when you no longer fear it, when you see it as part of your life, when you embrace it, it becomes a lot more palpable and controllable because you become curious about what is it, where is it coming from? And when you start to listen to it, it gives you deeper insights about yourself. Hmm. And as you start to understand where this might be coming from, what it might mean and how you might control it, because of that change in relationship that you're having, you come out with a whole different set of perspectives that then you can then build tools on because when you're no longer terrified of its existence, but rather than you can almost adopt this very stoic path of if it's here, I'll be okay. If it's not here, I'll be okay, but I'm going to figure it out either way. This is really heartening for you because now you're in a position to actually start really understanding it, which can be a magnificent thing. The experience can essentially, like we keep saying, accelerate the kind of like aha moment that is so difficult to understand intellectually. You know, it's like you could tell somebody this, but when you're stuck in the middle of a panic attack, I don't care what you're telling me. If I don't have the skill set or I haven't seen that there's a bit of bet that there's a different way of addressing with this, it's like I'm so lost. It's like it kind of is is straight over my head. Um, I think what would be useful um, is one of the workshops that you have on retreat is the sort of um, that diagram that you've developed to explain to people what an emotion is and how one can intervene at, you know, the, the sort of automatic physical sensations, thoughts about the sensations, and I'll, and I'll let you explain it in more detail. Um, because what I want to, what I want to uh, just flush out here is like, you have this experience that like I did, where I was able to kind of be like, Oh, I can breathe through this and it will pass. So I've actually like seen that it's actually possible in the depths of having my heart rate, you know, normally heart rates at 150, I'm off, right? I'm in, I'm in, I'm now in this panic attack, but now I've sort of seen like, oh, there's a different path. I have the insight like, oh, it's actually possible to do something. And now what you, what we, what we say about the therapy, keeping you well, what are some of the skills that would be taught? Like if you, if you were my therapist then, right? Yeah. So now, cool. And I now can see that I was able to breathe through this explain the that the sort of interconnected model of emotions and the various and some examples of the various skill sets that therapy teaches to be able to intervene and kind of break the cycle of panic so essentially we recognize across neuroscience and psychology that an emotion as a state consists of three components thoughts motions or behaviors and physiological reactions and so all three of these things link up so for instance, when you're having a panic attack, you may have physiological sensations that my heart rate is accelerated, my breathing is shallow, my muscles are tensing up, I feel hot flushes, my pupils are dilated, my mouth feels dry, I'm getting tingly sensations in my hands and my legs, I feel dizzy and lightheaded. Your thoughts in that moment might be, am I having a heart attack? Going to die. Die? die. That's the thought. <laughs> I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm never coming back from this. Um, all of these horrible thoughts are coming through, all these various catastrophes that are now occurring to you. And in that moment, you'll find that you're moving and reacting in certain ways. You might be closing your chest up, tightening things, kind of narrowing your vision, bringing your head down, um, tensing your muscles, pacing rapidly. You could be doing all of these things. Now, what's important is that each of these areas, each of these three components reciprocally influence one another. So your thoughts impact your physiology, your physiology impacts your thoughts, and the same applies for our emotions, our behaviors. So they feed into each other. And because they constantly feed into each other, they create this chain reaction that causes the emotion to grow and grow and grow. It's literally like but an electrical it's circuit. It's like, it's they're, 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 yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So because of that, you also recognize that 
because there's these three components, what's really valuable is by virtue of the interconnection, just like an electric circuit, if I intervene with one of them, I'm going to force changes in the other two as well. Mm -hmm. So I don't always have to hit all three at the same time. If I can just get my attention on one of them, I can do something remarkable. So very often, um, a psychologist will say to you, well, one of the things we can use to help you integrate now is to say, how are we going to manage panic attacks in the future? Well, we'll go, firstly, let's go to your physiology. And let's say, as much as your body feels overwhelmed in that moment, there are various methods by which we can calm down your physiology. Because you're in a state of what we call sympathetic hyperarousal. Your sympathetic nervous system is in fight or flight mode. It's, it's really moving hard. Let's use some techniques to bring that down. So we might teach you, as you say, to control your breathing. Long inhales through the nose, long exhales through the mouth, or the, the psychological side. Two deep inhales followed by one long exhale. By breathing in that way, you slow down your respiration, which slows down your heart rate, which is going to cause sympathetic arousal to go down, and you'll move into a more parasympathetic state. That's one option. We'll say we could Sorry, also just to, just to tie, keep going as it relates to your thoughts. And then as your physiology starts calming down, your thoughts will move from I'm going to die, I'm going to die, I'm going to die to oh, wait, I'm calming down, I'm calming down, I'm calming down. And that's what yeah. you were saying about intervening at one end and then having a train reaction to the other components. That's exactly right. So as that one breaks down, your thoughts go, oh, I can control it. Oh, I'm not going to die. Oh, I could live through this. And then when that happens, the next one comes in. Now your body posture starts changing. Yeah. Yeah. Now you start regulating your muscles, you loosen your limbs, and then you could do it in the other ways. I could say, but James, you're not going to die. I know you won't die. And then that might change the physiology, which will change the movement. Or I could say, let's, let's intervene at the postural place. Even though you're panicking right now, I'm going to try really, really hard to get you to relax your muscles and to, yeah. to move in a different way. Every area will help feed into the others. And so we'll teach you a totally different way of regulating yourself. And that's the powerful part. If you believe that you can survive this feeling, if you believe that you can control it, that it doesn't master you, ironically, you get less anxious about it occurring again. Mm -hmm. Because that's what panic attacks are about. It's not just that I'm worried it's happening now, it's worried that I'm forever going to have them. So we were essentially saying that once you master this process of being able to, to, to ride the emotional work with it, you no longer fear its reoccurrence. And because you no longer fear its reoccurrence, it doesn't really occur. Because you're no longer worried about having a panic attack, you don't panic anymore. And you slowly see that that big chain reaction actually starts to reverse. What became a horrible escalation of anxiety now becomes a soothing escalation towards calm. You know, I think that uh, it's probably because I've experienced it that I love this example of the power of psilocybin to help with acute uh, issues like this because obviously I went through it but it's I just think that like anxiety and panic is something that so many people can relate to like you can wrap your you can really wrap your arms around it so the first as we were saying is the experience gives you insights oh there's a different way to deal with this right that is that one can absolutely get without the drug as we keep saying but can take a long time to actually have that subjective experience and internalize it so again you can be taught it's theoretically like there is a different relationship you can have to anxiety here but like this is the problem with so much self-help and stuff that i've read it's, it's like it's so intellectual i'm reading a wonderful book at the moment on psychology which with amazing um examples of various tools that i can implement in my life but it's like it's just so much information and like life is so busy and stuff that like to be able to even find the time to practice and implement these things into one's life is just so overwhelming and it's, it's just not it just may not be practical right whereas in a single psilocybin session you can kind of skip over all the theory and just internalize it immediately like oh wow like i get it right so that's the one thing that it can accelerate the kind of subjective knowing that there is a different way and then as we as i was just saying about like you know, the difficulty in implementing these tools into our lives is that habits take a long time to change. And we're just, we, I know we've spoken about this, but it's just so, it's just, the, this this is the, the so what, is that, cool, so you have the experience, you see it as a different way, you've actually practiced the different way, so you can see you can do it. Now, you're going to develop a structured plan with a therapist to actually teach that is this example of intervening at each of the points, right? So you'll learn it intellectually, right? 
And the beautiful thing with this increased neuroplasticity is that two weeks after your one's experience, if and when one starts feeling anxiety, the increased neuroplasticity provides us with this kind of um, temporary superpower that it's like, ah, I've got this tool. I can pull this tool out of my toolbox and it's so much easier to actually implement it in, in practice as opposed to for it just being theoretical. It, I, I can't, I, it's so difficult for me to explain verbally how powerful that subjective experience is during this neuroplastic window of actually internally having this it is it's like a mini superpower for it for, for a period of time that it's like i understand it i can implement the tool and then i'm more likely to habituate it dur during this period this is this is the reason why psilocybin therapy is so and psychedelic therapy is so powerful it's precisely it it's incredibly well put there's only there's only probably one thing that, that I think I could add, because I think that's really a, a great summary of the massive benefit it creates, which is also to say that what psilocybin will also grant you is often an understanding of where some of those anxieties come from in the first place. What psilocybin will also grant you is often an understanding of where some of those anxieties come from in the first place. Because mm. Often when we're anxious, because we treat it like, you know, it's a pathology or a thing, it shouldn't be there. We get so caught up in the discomfort that we don't get an opportunity to sit and think about, but, but what is it about my future that I'm worried about? Because as you were saying, if we gave you just a moment to think about um, what you were saying, if you felt envy or you felt something like that about Elon Musk, if we gave you a moment, it told you exactly that. We said, but what's the underlying worry I have? And mm -hmm. it could be about my accomplishments. Or someone could say, well, I worry about losing my partner. I worry about, um, I worry about getting ill, whatever it might be. When you get a chance to drill down to it, it becomes powerful. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the unfortunate things that is our most common response to anxiety is avoidance. So quite intuitively, whenever, when, when we feel anxious, we avoid. And sometimes that's avoiding a situation, but sometimes that's avoiding a thought. And avoidance, when you look at it from a psychological perspective, is unfortunate because it's one of the worst things we can do in a lot of situations. The reason for that is that when you avoid an anxiety, not only does the problem not get better, it actually gets worse. It grows on you, gets worse. So often when, when, when I speak with people who are struggling with anxiety and I ask them, so tell me a little bit about what you worry about. And very often they jokingly say, well, everything. And I say, I implicitly agree with you. You're absolutely right. You should worry about everything. Everything is worry worthy. Um, but I guess probably some things might stand out more than others. And they really enjoy the exercise of getting incredibly specific. Mm -hmm. Because the, the more specific you get, well, the less uncertain you get. Even in dealing with your anxiety by pinpointing it, you limit the sense of uncertainty, which already does a remarkable amount of the work of healing the anxiety. And once we know what that particular thing is, we can then develop a strategy on how we're going to deal with it. How are we going to take it from disordered to understandable? Because there might be a need that you have. Um, there's something you really need to know. Many people will say, I've always had this deep anxiety. And what I realize now is because I feel like I'm not sure if my partner truly, uh, uh, truly accepts me. And we'd say, well, that, that might mean there's going to be room for a conversation. Now that you've unveiled this to yourself, what are those parts of you you're not sure about? And then they become really vulnerable with their partner and their partner gives them this deeply accepting experience and they feel more whole than they've ever been. This anxiety that was always nebulous in their lives that they weren't sure how to do, even now that they know how to ride it and manage the feeling, they also know how to hit it at its core because they know where it was emanating from in the first place. And that can also be a really powerful advantage of using something like a psychedelic is it's, you'll know how to manage it, but you'll also know how to deal with it at its root. Uh, you, you, you took the words out of my mouth. Well, everything I had just been describing on my subjective experience is, is, is essentially symptomology, right? It's, 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 I, I'm, I have this horrible feeling I'm now, and then learning how to deal with the symptoms and helping the symptoms go away. But as you were saying, the difference, I think I asked you in another chat, we had the difference between coaching and therapy. 
and you said should he said therapy actually addresses root cause and 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 that's the and that's exactly what you just described here so it's very powerful at both symptomology and root cause and creating insight and as you say if you can remove the root cause as you said the anxiety well it's so powerful because as you were saying anxiety is a part of life so you you do what learning how to deal with the symptomology is critical we actually can't get through life in a productive way without that but removing the root cause will make will will remove the unnecessary suffering in life right that you're only going to be anxious when it actually is healthy to be anxious about something as opposed to be to, to for it, the system to be running the kind of malfunctioning when it comes to treating anxiety that is that is one of the places that psilocybin shines brightest mm. that's from anything from specific phobias to obsessive compulsive to trauma to anxiety specifically all the way to our existential worries like death anxiety because even, oh. even some of the preliminary research showed that it can even help at the deepest existential level. So whether disordered or whether a feature of your life, fortunately, this would not be an inappropriate course of action. Wonderful. And I think that's it. I mean, lastly, is there anything anything of value you think you could, you'd could you want to share with someone suffering from anxiety in the throes of it? Um, yeah. Anything, anything else you have for them? Absolutely. I think, I think the most important point that I could raise is one that I'm hoping has been implicit through all of this, which is that it's very important if you are struggling very heavily with anxiety to know that it's not because there's something wrong with you. And certainly it's not because you need to learn to escape this feeling, even though it feels intolerable, what I hope you'll get to see in your life or in a journey or in therapy is that it's not a problem that you're feeling what you're feeling. It's that you haven't had a chance yet to understand what it means and how to deal with it. And the great news for you is that you will one day discover one way or another that it all meant something and you're so much stronger than you think. The mm. cure to all of this is not to believe that the world and everything is safe because it's not. The cure to anxiety is to recognize that you're capable of so much more than you realize.